If you're easily dissuaded from this type of work or this type of environment, you probably shouldn't be in it. <laughs> I think a lot of people have said that, sort of like, listen, if you don't have any other option, then by all means, get into recording. But do it only because you can't do anything else. That, like, nothing else is an option. Because it's, it's not an easy business to be in. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw. I created this show to introduce you to real-world recording professionals to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can take your records to the next level and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Slough Halliton a recording engineer, producer, and owner of B-Sharp Studio in New York City, where he specializes in classical, jazz, musical theater recordings, as well as rock and pop music. Slough has credits with many Grammy, Oscar, and Tony Award-winning artists like Steve Haubin, Ulysses Owens Jr., Vince Giordano, Dennis Dyken, and Sean Pelton, to name a few. But you might be more likely to know some of these names for the artists and bands they represent, such as Steely Dan, King Crimson, The Smithereens, James Taylor, Hall & Oates, Cassandra Wilson, and Wynton Marsalis. He is also the host of a great podcast called Sessions with Slough, where he takes you behind the scenes at B-Sharp Studio to listen to excerpts from sessions, gear reviews, and equipment shootouts. Go check out some of his past interviews with rock stars like Ed Cherney and Mixer Man. Great stuff. And I have to give a thank you for today's interview to one of our own rock stars, Jose Neto, who enjoyed listening to my interview with Blessing Offer so much that he reached out to connect me with Slough for this interview. What do Jose, Blessing, and Slough have in common? They are all three blind recording engineers and make great records despite this obvious obstacle. In fact, Slough works directly with Avid and Pro Tools to help make it accessible for blind and visually impaired audio engineers and musicians. Please welcome Slough Halliton to Recording Studio Rockstars. Slough, my friend, are you ready to rock? Woo! <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the best one yet, man. Well done. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, can you also introduce yourself in your own words and let us know more about who you are and, and where you come from? Uh, yeah, I'm, I was uh, born in New York City, uh, grew up here and started off as a musician playing in dance bands and stuff, played a lot of clubs. At that time, I mean, I was really young. I was like 16, 17 years old, but all the band members were several years older than me. But I felt a little bit out of place as, you know, at that age in some of these, you know, clubs like the Red Parrot and Maji, the Underground, you know, the crowd was a lot considerably older than me at that time. I got involved in music as a performer, as a musician first. And then at one point I, I had an opportunity to do some session work as a guitarist for some like documentaries and commercials and stuff like that. And that was like my first exposure to recording studios. And, uh, you know, that was just... That was it. <laughs> I said, this is what I would like to do. I would like to just create stuff in the studio. It still was a few years before I ended up doing that full time. But once I caught that bug, it was, you know, it was, it was festering. You know, I absolutely understand and empathize. I had the same experience. I was playing in a band in Hong Kong, of all places, when I sort of saw my first professional studio. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember that feeling, you know, especially at the time that we might have seen our first studios, there was a lot of blinking lights and a lot of big, huge machinery that was required, tape machines and, and mixing oh, sure. consoles. I don't know. Oh, sure, yeah. You know, somebody's experience today might be just seeing a laptop. Hopefully, they're seeing something more than that. <laughs> yeah. Really, the recording industry has changed so, so much. You know, those of us who, who were in it 20, 25, 30 years ago have seen a tremendous change. People who are coming up now you know, who are, let's say, in their 20s, really, you know, didn't have that experience, really. In a way, it's too bad. It's a shame. But in a way, you know, it's, this is the future. Digital recording being what it is and power of laptops being what they are. You know, it's a different world. It really is. Well, it is kind of exciting. It, it does feel a bit like seeing the inside of a studio for the first time when you first get to see the inside of Pro Tools or Logic or Studio One mm -hmm. or one of these DAWs. Well, so Slough, we like to start out the podcast with an inspirational quote. Do you have one that you'd like to share with us? There's a quote that I remember, and I'll tell you how it 
applies to the arts and music and recording specifically. And I believe it might have been Somerset Maum. I, I don't recall who said this originally, but it goes, Absence is to love what wind is to fire. It extinguishes the small and it enkindles the great. That's a great saying f- to begin with. As it pertains to love specifically, uh, literally, it's a great statement. You know, I perceive it as also being the love of anything that you do. You know, you know how kids, they want a toy. They want some kind of game or whatever. They play with it for a week and then it's in the closet and they never play with it again. Yeah, I still do that. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> They're called plugins. <laughs> But, you know, as far as like just the music world in general and recording and stuff, I know that a lot of people have, you know, the the gear acquisition uh, syndrome and sort of, you know, have to get the latest toy, the latest whatever it is, plug in or just anything, whatever it is. And, you know, that stuff sometimes I've seen it with other people. They get it. They play with it a little while. And then it's like, "Mm." and that's where that whole, you know, the absence extinguishes the small and kindles the great. You know, if you don't have a particular piece of gear that you've used, you know, in the past or whatever, but you use it all the time. If you're without it, you'll make do with whatever. All you need is a couple of tools and and you're and you're good to go. But, you know, when you are passionate about what you do and you're doing it every day, I think that no matter what the tools are, no matter what you have in your possession, no matter what you have in your life, you're going to produce, put out content. Nothing's going to stop you, in other words. And that's where I sort of look at that quote and say that, you know, if if you're easily dissuaded from this type of work or this type of environment, you probably shouldn't be in it. (laughs) I think a lot of people have said that sort of like, listen, if you don't have any other option, then by all means, get into recording. But do it only because you can't do anything else. That like nothing else is an option because it's it's not an easy business to be in. Michael Beinhorn pretty much said the same thing, which was just, you mm-hmm. know, do this because you just can't do anything else. This is your calling. This is all you can really be doing. Exactly. But, you know, it's interesting. You talk about the idea of toys and then going back into the closet. And I agree that there's, that happens when we get stuff, when we get, sometimes when we get new software, sometimes when we get new physical things. They're exciting for a minute. Even microphones, you know, they might yeah. go, go into the mic closet. But yeah. it's one of the things that I really appreciate about learning. And when you get new learning, um, whether you necessarily use it or not, it still sticks with you and it's cumulative in a good way. Mm-hmm. The more you learn about recording and the more techniques you learn and the more you learn about music, it kind of all stays with you and grows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's an ongoing, you know, uh, ongoing yes, there, uh, yeah. development process. <laughs> You've yeah. coined a new phrase, ongoing. Ongoing, yes. <laughs> all right, well, so Slough, um, tell us about a moment of sort of an important failure story for you, something where things really maybe didn't go so well, but turned out to be a great learning experience or positive in the end. I've been fortunate that I haven't had big screw-ups. There have been a lot of little screw-ups. I make mistakes all the time. Most of those mistakes would never matter to anybody. But, you know, because it's me doing those tasks, I say to myself, ah, you know, I should have done this or I forgot to do this. You know, things like that, these little cumulative, little tiny things that each time I go through these, I'm sort of self-correcting, readjusting my course. So I can't think of any like big failures. I will tell you two things though that might be of interest. One time I was I was doing a session with a jazz group, you know, they're cutting it live in the studio and the drummer didn't bring his own kit and he was supposed to. And like, I thought, oh, crap. You know, I had put the drum kit away. It was like buried in one of the storage closets. You know, I was like, oh, I was like running in there trying to pull out everything, you know, so that the guy could set up a kit. Luckily, he had come here a little bit early. And I had all of the mics sort of connected, tested, ready to go. All I had to do was like put them into place. But I think I was so thrown off by the fact that now suddenly I had to go, you know, pulling gear out of the closet that when it came time to put the mics on the on the kit... I like, I position the overheads first, kick drum, et cetera, et cetera. 
And then we were listening back during the live takes. We were up to, I think, take three of this tune. And I was telling my assistant at the time, I was going through the tracks as they were playing. And I was saying, yeah, here's here's the piano isolated, you know. And so, yeah, look how much isolation we get in there. And here's the bass and this and that. I'm going through the tracks. And now I'm going through the drum tracks. I get to the snare track. And it sounds completely distant. I'm like, wow, that's weird. I, I go to the overheads and, you know, the snare is there. It's clear he's using brushes. I go back to the snare mic and it's like, it's so distant. And then I realized, <laughs> oh, fuck. I never positioned the snare mic. It was like three feet away. So it was like a total, a total failure. But, I mean, luckily, they took a little break after that third take. I quietly went in there, put the mic in front of the snare, and they did two more takes, and it was the fifth take that was used. It wasn't a spectacular failure, but it was a failure, and I learned from it, you know. I thought perhaps you would say that the snare drum mic became your room mic for the drums, and it turned right, into I this magical have. sound. You know? I could have, yes, yes. <laughs> or better yet, when he came in, you just said, you know, and you were frustrated about setting up the drum kit, you just handed him a, a dynamic mic. You're like, how do you feel about beatboxing? <laughs> <laughs> This I would consider a much bigger failure on my part, only that I take responsibility for this because it was my project. And, uh, well, I'll just explain that I was recording drums for a new album of mine. Last album I put out was back in like 2001. It's been way too long. But I started recording another album, called in my dear friend, George Robb, drummer extraordinaire. I called in another engineer, a friend of mine, very accomplished, highly accomplished engineer. And I said, hey, listen, after we take levels and everything's all set, I do not want to look at Pro Tools. I don't want to think about Pro Tools. I don't want to think about playlists, takes, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to even have that hat on. I'm producer, you know? Yeah. So that was his role, was just to be sort of looking out for Pro Tools. After the first song, we took levels, you know, we had taken levels in the first song, we recorded the first song, went on to the second song. You know, and meanwhile, he says, okay, so what song are we doing next? And I go, let's just go alphabetically. I think the next one is come and get it. And so he's like clicking around, clicking around. And then suddenly I hear the song, you know, he's, he's got it up on the thing. I go, yeah, yeah, that's it, that's it. So we continued recording, went through, I think at about four hours, yeah, four hours, we did the entire album. And we did about two or three takes of each song. At the end of it, I said, okay, well, listen, you know, we're, we were done with the session. I said, let me just do a backup, a carbon copy cloner backup. I have a script, you know, in the view menu under carbon copy cloner is just, you know, it takes two particular drives, clones them. And I have it set up to delete stuff from the backup drive, the drive that is called backup, because I don't need anything on there if I don't have it on the first drive. I have like... I have these all in a magma chassis. So I have magma one, two, three, and four. And then I have magma one backup, magma two backup, et cetera, et cetera. So we go through the thing and then we're sitting there talking and I'm figuring this is like about 40 gigs of data. It's going to take ah, 10 minutes. And so we're sitting there talking and he goes, uh, oh, it looks like it's done. I go, what? That was only like a minute. I go, it can't be done. He's like, oh, it says it's done. I'm like, oh, shit. So I take a look. I look in, I look in the first song and there's the drum files in the first drive and in the backup. I go to the second drive. There are no drum tracks. Neither in the first drive or the second drive. I go to the third song, the fourth song, the fifth song, the rest of the songs. None of them have drums. And I'm like, what? I, I, I'm like dumbfounded. I'm gobsmacked. <laughs> oh, so what he, what he had done inadvertently was he went to the backup drive instead of the first drive. Yep. So we were always recording to the backup drive after the first song. And so when during the carbon copy cloner process, everything got deleted from the, oh, from the backup drives. It's, it's just painful, man. My heart hurts right now. Oh, I'm telling you. And he felt so bad. I felt bad, you know, because he felt bad. I felt bad because George had come out, you know, had spent half of his day, you know, recording, mm -hmm. and it was gone. I mean, I tried to retrieve the files. I was able to restore the files, but every WAV file only played for about 15 seconds, and then it was silence uh, for the rest of the files. So they got corrupted. Ah, uh, so horrible. And I knew you, that's where you were headed because I've experienced that same problem where we did— we had a backup drive that was called backup, and then we had the master session drive. Yeah. And, and the— um, production partner that I was working with, yeah. 
he opened the session by accident off the backup drive. Off the backup drive, yeah. yeah. And he recorded. We did all the vocals for this song, oh. fully comped and 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 oh, multiple man. takes for the whole day. It's painful, and and you know the thing is, like I, I wasn't angry. I, I felt, you know, sad that this happened. But you know what? I take responsibility because I should not have even had those backup drives mounted. You know what I mean? I left myself open to that possibility, and I should have made sure that there was no chance of a failure like that. Now, in the end, look, first of all, like I said, it's my album, so it wasn't a catastrophe. Had that happened to another client, that would have been 10 times worse. Sure, sure. But, you know, we we scheduled another session. The two guys came back. And it was even better the second time. So in the end, it all worked out. Yeah, when something like that happens, you learn. You you have to make sure you learn from it. I learned to switch Carbon Copy Cloner to have its safety net on so that it doesn't delete the extra files and, like, just let it sit there. Let it just keep piling up. It'll eventually get overwritten, but, you know, a year from now rather than right on the spot. (laughs) You know, at the risk of... I've gone on a tangent here. I will share mm-hmm. a story with you that happened to mm-hmm. me that is, is very similar. This mm-hmm. was not in the computer, though. This was on the tape machine. So mm-hmm. this was years ago, and I was doing sure. a recording with the band. I, I can't remember if we were doing demos or album. It didn't really matter. It was, it was very important stuff. And we had recorded all morning up till lunch. We're on a tape machine, so I had all the tracks, all 24 tracks in record. Yeah, and uh, before we left for lunch, I thought, well, I'll just take the, I'll just disarm the tracks just to be safe. So I yeah. disarmed all the tracks, and then we came back, and the tape machine was still an in input. So that means for you guys, rock stars, that means that you could hear all the audio coming through it, yes. but none of the tracks were ready to record. Right. And, and so then we jumped back in, got ready for the next song, did multiple takes of it, really nailed a great take, a finished take. And then we moved on to the next song. And then the the guy from the publishing company who happened to be sitting in the control room with me as we were working, yeah. he turns to me and he goes, shouldn't those tracks be red? You know, he was looking over at the lights on the right. tape machine. And yeah. sure enough, I, the tape machine was showing that it was recording, but none of the tracks were actually recording anything. So yep. That's one of the reasons why I do not use input monitoring in Pro Tools. Yeah. Because, like, I'm going to pay attention to that and, like, I'm not going to be aware that we weren't actually in record. I always just use the record button for the input monitoring. You know, I I flip back and forth between auto input and input monitoring, but that's just a keystroke and I can, you know, instantly sort of tell. Well, you'd be surprised, uh, Slough, at how many people don't even know what auto input monitoring is. Can you explain it for our listeners? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, with input monitoring in Pro Tools, and I know that it's possibly a little bit different in sort of Pro Tools vanilla versus HD, but if you're in auto input monitoring, when you engage the transport, you're listening to what's been recorded, if anything has been recorded. And if you have tracks record enabled, but you're not in record mode, you won't hear anything. Like, in other words, if a person is in front of a mic and you're not in record, you won't hear them. If you're in input-only monitoring, the shortcut is option K, you can hear the person even though you're not in record. So let's say a person just wants to do a couple of rehearsals. If you're in input-only monitoring, any record-enabled tracks will play back the input source as opposed to anything that's been recorded on that track. Right. So you'll hear yourself on the mic when you're in input, but if you're in auto-input, you'll hear what's playing back off Pro Tools before you, and then when you go into record, you hear yourself. Right, so you typically use auto input for like punching in and stuff like that so that people can hear what's been been done before and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah. Well, so to wrap up my story, I didn't tell anybody right away what happened. Uh I just put them into record, and then after the band got that take of the second song, I walked out there and I said, hey guys, I got unfortunate news for you. I, I screwed up. And I didn't even record any of that song before this after lunch. Yeah. So it was the right way to do it because it didn't derail the session and the yeah. timing was right. But they went ahead and they were forgiving and they just said, okay, well, let's just do it again. And they nailed it. And it's yeah. something that I noticed that you mentioned too. And I think it's worth commenting on. It's different whether you're doing infinite takes because you can in a computer versus when you lose that other take and you have to do it again. But Mm -hmm. when you have to do it again, I've kind of noticed in the studio that more often than not, 
it's better the next time you do it. Have you noticed that? I guess so. And the thing is, I come from a you know a world where people weren't necessarily so precious about those takes because if you if you had to do another take, you knew that you were going to be erasing a previous take. So it was like, okay, you decided, am I going to do it? Am I not? Uh, can I? Do I think I can do it better? And you did it. And you just went ahead boldly. Now we're used to sort of like everything being kept and it's just deferred to decision making as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, as far as like, you know, doing multiple takes or doing stuff over again, I find that very often it ends up being better. Very often. Not all the time, but yeah. quite often, yeah. If you're doing it better just for no really good reason, just to see, and you've still got the take before it, then maybe nobody's really invested in this next take and it's not necessarily better. But there have been times where when something breaks or you just have to do it again, I've noticed yeah. that sometimes people just, they go for it. I find that these days with the sort of non-destructive capabilities of editing and recording that it sometimes helps to be able to say to a person, hey, listen, we have this in the can. We That last take was great. But since we have that in the can, let's just do one more. It's a throwaway take. I mean, you have no risk. You're not recording over anything. And I find that people just relax then because they know that they have something good already. So, you know, sometimes that more relaxed take ends up being even better. And if not, it's fine. We, we always have the previous take. True, true enough. Sometimes being very relaxed or being very dedicated to the result is the way to go. So Slough, let's ask you for a moment of success for you, a time where things really came together well for you in the studio or in your career. If I had to choose a particular sort of turning point, I think it was when I was living in London and I got a call from a producer in Edmonton, Alberta, I was referred to him by a friend. You know, we had a friend in common, and uh, he was looking for a recording engineer to do some orchestral recording in, in Ukraine, in Kiev. And he asked me if I'd be interested, and I said, sure, yeah, that sounds great. I'd love to. Yeah, really? Um, Why not? <laughs> and, you know, he asked me if, if I had experience uh, recording orchestras. I said, yeah, absolutely. Of course, I didn't. Naturally, I called all of my friends who recorded orchestras, <laughs> hit the books, and studied up and was flying by the seat of my pants. But here's the thing. In, in that situation, uh, it was a dance ensemble. Of, it's like about 50 members or so, and they would tour with an orchestra, but it got prohibitively expensive. And they wanted to tour from that point on with digital recordings of orchestras. Poor musicians. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> but they did a recording in Kiev, and they took this recording on the road, and they said it sounded, they said it sounded terrible in the, in the theaters. Oh, no. And we're talking like five, 6,000 seat auditoriums. They wanted to change things. They wanted to make sure that somebody's there who knows what they're doing and stuff. So they sent me a copy of the recording that they used on the previous show as the Nutcracker. And I listened to this recording and it, first of all, it was, it was not very good technically at the outset. But the other thing was there was, there was this digital reverb added to it, which sounded horrible, but plenty of it as well. I knew immediately that this was an issue because if you play back, you know, a highly reverberant recording in a big auditorium, everything's going to sound washed out. Yeah. And I said to the producer, what we have to do is record this orchestra as dry as possible. And he said, you sure? <laughs> and I said, yes. Yeah. And I was gambling. It was a gamble. But I felt that that was the way to go. I had, again, consulted with other colleagues of mine that, that had recorded orchestras and they understood what I was trying to achieve. And they said, well, that, that does sound reasonable, what you're, you know, what you're shooting for. And I went out there in 1994 to Kiev, recorded the orchestra bone dry. And I got a call from that producer while they were on the road. I think they were in Australia at the time doing a tour. And I get this phone call from him and, you know, it's like, you know, you, you answer the phone, you hear, shh, beep, shh. you know, it's like, what are these... What? Oh, this sounds like a, one of those long overseas calls. And suddenly I hear his voice. And he says, hey, listen, I had to tell you that every theater we've been going to, like all the front of house engineers have been saying, wow, this sounds great. This recording sounds great. And again, I had taken a risk, but it paid off because the producer was thrilled. It did the trick. You know, uh, what I set out to do um, worked. And I've I've had that gig ever since. So it's been 22 years now or something. Wow. And so, you know, I think a great takeaway is that when the opportunity came along, you were willing to take a huge risk and just say, yeah, sure, I can do that. And then just figure it out. Yes, it was a risk. In my 
estimation, it wasn't a big risk because to record an orchestra with essentially little to no room sound, which of course is, it's impossible to record it without the room sound, but to sort of like not add anything, to not accentuate anything and to mix the thing where you're sort of focused on individual instruments, microphones, you know, spot miking as opposed to just the deca tree or something like that, uh, it's a bit of a risk. Mm -hmm. and, and it totally paid off, though. I was, I was very fortunate. That's very cool. Yeah. And I think another takeaway for you rock stars is to be, realize that when you are mixing in your home studio environments, if your space, for example, is reverberant, it's going to affect the way that you mix because you may start finding that your mixes are really dry. You don't want to, you hesitate to add stuff or vice versa. If it's really, really dead, you might add more effects to it. So the room yeah. that you listen back to makes a huge impact on the sound of it. Sure. Well, both both the recording room and the, and the mixing room, yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, so Slough, tell us, what's one of the, your favorite things? What, what do you really love most about your job? One of the things that I really love most is that it's never the same thing twice. There's always some new project. Even that said, I mean, I, I do a lot of these musical cast albums, like these off-Broadway productions. It's the same kind of work, in the sense that it's it's very much, you know, the music is recorded first and then we're bringing in singers and different sort of groupings of singers to do the stuff. So it is the same kind of work, but it's never the same music. It's never the same singers. Well, I shouldn't say that. It's often working with some of the same singers, but more often than not, it's new people coming in in different sort of groupings. And, you know, it's just never boring. It's so rewarding at the end to sort of wrap up a project. And then there's always something either already taking place, you know, different projects or something on the immediate horizon. You know, to me, I, I'm the luckiest person in the world to have that kind of a situation. Yeah, I, I love hearing that. And Chad Brown even just pointed out on the podcast, you know, it's a privilege to be able to record music for a living. It really is. I mean, I'm not at all a religious person. I have no sort of no religious affiliations. In fact, I'm an atheist. But to me, recording music is sacred. I mean, it really is. By whatever definition I have, I mean, it's something that is so deep and so moving. At least it can be. I suppose sometimes it's not, depending on what you're recording. But I've been lucky enough to work with people that are on such a high level that it's not like I'm recording somebody who's just putzing around in the studio and you know, just trying to record a little demo or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a difference there. But even on that level, I think on just about any musical level, when you're working with people, they are expressing who they are. You know, even if their expression is, hey, I'm an independent musician who's making a demo right now. And there's something wonderful about being able to help people oh, yeah. express themselves artistically. Sure. You know, you realize that what they're doing is sincere and it's coming from somewhere deep inside. I mean, usually yeah. if people are going through the trouble and expense and, you know, all of the other things, the trials and tribulations of recording something, it means something to them, you know, so it is sacred. I mean, to me, I was thinking, oh, geez, I should start like a church of sound or something like that. <laughs> Maybe get some, you know, tax-free okay. status. I, I think John Coltrane already has a church out in the West Coast. <laughs> so, yeah. Slough, let's talk about the thing we haven't talked about yet, too, which is mm. you have a very unique situation, or at least mm. uh, more unique than most people in the studio. Uh -huh. You are blind. You're a blind yeah. recording engineer. And so yeah. I think that for those of us who are not, it's pretty fascinating to wonder how do you even do that, you know? It certainly has its challenges. Of course, I was sort of trained at a time when everything was quite tactile. So, you know, I was working with consoles that had dedicated EQ, you know, buttons, all that, you know, faders, etc. And that's why to this day, I still prefer to mix, you know, using a control surface, mm -hmm. because it's just so much faster for me. It's so much more efficient. And back in the day, you know, when I was working with tape, I still had enough sort of residual vision to be able to see a VU meter. It got to the point, let's say, over time where I wouldn't pay attention to the to the needle so much as I would like look at the peak light sometimes when I was like making sure that I was getting drums, just getting to that sort of point of tape compression and stuff. Mm -hmm. But in, in terms of like aligning a machine, you know, the needle wasn't jumping around. It was pretty stationary. So it was kind of easy. Yeah, you can hear the needles banging on the machine if you're you hitting can. it too hard. You can, yeah, yeah. I remember those days. 
Now, how do you address a level now? What is there a method that allows you to know if you're getting overs, other than it sounds like digital distortion? Oh, no, like right within Pro Tools. I mean, you know, I've worked with DigiDesign and Avid for years now, since around 2006. So it's been around 10 years now. Okay. Uh, You know, to make Pro Tools accessible so that the UI elements are actually exposed to the built-in screen reader in OS X, which is known as VoiceOver. So, for example, within the channel strip, you know, you have your level meter, your peak meter and stuff like that. All of that stuff is visible to voiceover. So I keep track of that. I tend not to worry about preamps so much. I think I've heard preamp distortion maybe three times in my life. Okay. (laughs) You know, I mean, it's not an issue for yeah. me and stuff. And, you know, you get to the point where when you know your preamps so much or so well, I get to the point where, I mean, I have been at a point for years now where if I know that people are stepping up to the mic, say, for one of these cast album recordings, I tend to use Millennia Pre's for that, for example. And I just happen to know, like, pretty much exactly where to set those Pre's for an average singer, yeah. you know? yeah. And then I'll, I'll, of course, double check within Pro Tools just to make sure that I'm giving myself enough headroom that I'm not sort of coming close to, uh, you know, I usually keep them the minus 10, minus 6 maximum. Mm-hmm. And then when you're mixing, so you might do compression and treatment on a vocal at the mix stage, mm-hmm. you can still manipulate the plugins. Yeah. And, and yeah. so here's a, here's a question, because these ones are popping into my head as we're talking about yeah, this. Yeah, sure, sure. What's the experience like for you when you're comparing different plugins? So for us, mm-hmm. for example, you know, they make these, uh, when I say us, I just mean for those w- with vision, you can yeah. see, you know, they may give you, it looks like an old, you know, Fairchild 670 or something, or it right, looks like right. a Neve 1073. Right, does, right. does it sort of homogenize that stuff for you and make it easier to, to tell what you think about plugins because you just you're just they're, they all have the same knob settings you're just hearing yeah. the difference? Yeah, I think I have that advantage of not seeing that eye candy. I have never, ever, ever, ever evaluated a plugin based on its look, <laughs> and I think that that is sort of a, a little bit of a mesmerizing thing, you know, to people who sort of you know, look at a plug and then they go, oh, this plug sounds great. So you, you haven't even... seen any of the new floral patterns? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, have not. So, uh, you know, everything with plugins, as far as the way VoiceOver sees it in Pro Tools, it's just parameters. It's all you see. You just see the parameters and you just adjust them. You see what that parameter is, what its value is, and you could boost it, cut it, change the frequency, et cetera, et cetera. But like, you're not at all influenced by what it looks like, you know. So, which, you know, hey, it is what it is. I'm not influenced by what gear looks like in the hardware world. Right. Although I am definitely, certainly influenced by how it feels. I mean, because, you know, you feel a nice, thick switch click into place and you go, oh, this is built like a tank, you know. Or you feel something flimsy and you go, oh, I don't know. You know, but the two are different. One is hardware and one is software. And and in terms of the software world, yes, I'm sure there's varying degrees of quality, undoubtedly, in terms of the algorithms, how things are written. But I don't judge them based on anything other than how they sound to me. That's it. Well, so are there some, this may be hard to riff on off the top of your head, but are there some new plugins that have come along that had new settings within them that didn't exist in other plugins that are remarkable to you? Yeah, they, it is difficult to think of off the top of my head. But what I can say is that plugins like Sound Radix Drum Leveler, mm-hmm. holy shit, I am stunned by what it can do in terms of like gating and stuff like that. I could never get that kind of result or effect with any other plugin. I haven't been able to. Maybe somebody else has. You know, the, the SPL Transient Designer. Oh my gosh. I used the hardware unit once, but in a rental situation is like, oh, this is great. But it wasn't like I was using it every day, but I did know that that was something that I wanted to look into and I got one. You know what I mean? I got the plug-in and it's just fantastic. By the way, I usually ride things into the SPL Transient Designer, sort of like, you know, on a console, let's say you ride a vocal track into a compressor, Mm -hmm. you know, rather than keeping it 
in the insert. Yeah. So how do you do that? What what do you use to ride it going in? Well, I use another track in Pro Tools. So in other words, I have the the actual, let's say, a snare track, for example. I'll put a drum leveler into that track. Let's say, and I typically do this for snare because that's where I find that it's most useful. I try to eliminate hi-hat bleed to, into that snare mic. And then sometimes when you have these situations where there's a, you know, out of, let's say, eight snare hits in a couple of bars, maybe two of them aren't exactly where they should be. You wish they were a little bit hotter or, you know what I mean, like a little bit more aggressive. Well, if you simply bring up the volume, all you're going to have is a louder snare that doesn't have the character that you're looking for. Mm. But if you route that output to an SPL track with a, a SPL transient designer on it, and set it at an appropriate level. If you raise the level of the snare track going into that transient designer, it'll give it more of a snap. So you will actually change the character of the snare. So it sounds like the snare is snappier when you want it, not all the time. You back it off for the rest of the song, but you know, for those areas where you need it to have more of a crack, you just ride it into that compressor. And that's a little more old school too. That's a little more of what it, felt like to mix in yeah. a console, right? Exactly. Because I used to do that all the time and you know, with a multi-track recorder and, and a console. And so here it is essentially I'm I'm doing the same kind of thing. And then, you know, at the end of it you could print it or whatever and just get rid of the extra track, et cetera. You know, so. and another analogy for those of you who are guitar players, imagine the difference between a solid state guitar amp and a tube guitar amp and how as you dig harder into the guitar with the solid state, maybe the guitar gets a lot louder versus a tube. It might kind of saturate the tubes more. And, and so yeah. it allows you to be expressive with your, with your mm-hmm. playing. So those are great tips. We're going to go here and take a break and go to the jam session and then come back for that. But before we switch gears, can I ask you a couple mm-hmm. of quick questions about your experience yeah. in the studio? Sure. And bear with me on this. If I was to walk yeah. in on a session while you yeah. were in there in the studio... Would there be any lights on? Would the screen be on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there would be, of course. And I say, of course, because I work with other people, so why would I not have the lights on? True, true, true. But I do know, I I certainly do know some blind musicians who, when they're working alone, you know, there's no need for them to turn on a light. And sometimes, like now, when I'm not in a session, I have, like, let's say I have a 46-inch monitor suspended from the ceiling, you know, over the, the... you know, the, the control surface mm-hmm. over the, the big desk and stuff like that over the, the windows to the live room. And it's freaking bright. And the thing is, that's enough light for me. To me, it doesn't matter specifically if it's on, but it does help me a little bit with orientation. Mm. You know, if I turn around a couple of times and I'm like doing stuff, you know, sometimes you can sort of like start to lose your bearing a little bit. And so having that light source and I can detect the light source, sometimes that's helpful. Of course, when there's music playing, then of course I hear the speaker. So I always have a reference. That's fascinating. Um, Okay. Mm -hmm. So next question is, I know that one of the ways that you interface with the computer is the same thing that I'm familiar with from working with Blessing Offer, which is you have the voiceover speaks very quickly to you and and tells you what's on the screen and what's going on. And um, Mm -hmm. maybe you could talk about that for just a sec, but here was something I proposed to Blessing, which is I thought maybe the the whole world could have a takeaway from that. What if we could speed Uh listen through music, what would that experience be like? If you could make decisions that are sort of routine maybe, but you can arrive at them quickly because you could quickly go through the song. Could you even see that working? Yes, it can work actually. And just incidentally, I'll just back up a second. I don't know if you are aware, because you mentioned Blessing Offer. I actually recorded Blessing's vocals for his first album. Oh, cool. I had no idea. That's yeah, really well, cool. Yeah. He had just relocated from Nashville to New York and his producer, Steve Ivey, sort of asked me to, well, Blessing was the one who came to me sort of asking if I would be able to record his vocals and stuff. And then I communicated with his producer in Nashville and we sort of, you know, set it up, et cetera, et cetera. And then, then yeah, of course, Years later, my uh, brother, who who likes to watch these like sort of American Idol and those kinds of shows, he says to me, "Yeah, this is a blind guy on the Voice, uh, whatever it was." And um, 
And he said, didn't you work with this guy, Blessing? I said, oh my gosh, Blessing? Yeah. I was like so stunned to see that he got to the That's voice. cool. That's him. great. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, yes, typically when I work in Pro Tools, like, you know, there are a lot of keyboard shortcuts, of course. So I sort of move around using a lot of keyboard shortcuts. But I find that very often, I'd say most often, like if I'm just moving um, through a track and I'm doing some editing, I'm always using shuttle mode, uh, numeric keypad. Mm -hmm. I don't use the transport mm. mode because to me it's kind of redundant to have a record button and a rewind and fast forward because I have all those in front of me on the keyboard and on the control surface. So I use shuttle mode plus I also use like if you if you add the control modifier to the numeric keypad you get into that sort of like it's a version of shuttle lock in a way so that you know when you do control 9 you're moving forward at like 16 times the speed or something like mm -hmm. that. And so I'm able to, I, I've gotten used to recognizing things at a very high speed. And yeah, I mean, it's just, that's what you get used to, you know. And the thing with the, with voiceover, of course, for any blind, you know, screen reader user, yeah, they're they're used to hearing it ripping at such a high speed, a high rate of speed. And so that's fascinating. Have you ever yeah. found that you are faster at Pro Tools than some other engineers who... In some tasks, but not in all, of right. course. It depends. And just I try to be as fast as I can wherever possible. I mean, yeah, like sometimes, again, those keyboard shortcuts, people will go mousing around trying to find something. Where, you know, I'll be there sooner than they will in terms of like navigation. Yeah, your fingers uh, are doing but... a twister on the keyboard, right? Yeah, like if I'm fast forwarding through a section where we did a live take or something like that, and there's some silence, since I'm forwarding through it, albeit at eight times or 16 times speed, it still does take a few seconds for me to perhaps reach that point where I do hear everything kick in and then I back up and cut the files there or whatever. Whereas a sighted person would see exactly where that is. Though sometimes my clients say, oh, it's coming up, it's coming up right here. And, you know, of course, a sighted engineer is just going to take that right. <laughs> trimmer tool and just point to that spot, boom, they're mm -hmm. done. So they're just certain things that are always going to be faster for a sighted engineer. Uh, well, so what are, what are some of the instances where you might recommend to anybody, hey, you know, if you knew how to do this high-speed listen, this would really help you in these situations? Can you think of any? I think that if you were used to listening to music that way, you might find it helpful. But the thing is, again, if you don't, I don't know that there's specifically anything about that style of working or navigating or editing that's particularly more helpful. Well, let me let me interject just, a question yeah. here. So I'll throw out a yeah. suggestion. What about you're listening through and you're just telling if the parts were played correctly or if their drum fills sounded good? Can you actually judge musical parts at that speed? Oh, I wouldn't say. No, no not really? Okay. No. I, th I think, yeah, because if a drummer is off at normal speed by just a hair, if you're listening back to it at two times or four times speed, that hair is going to be virtually nothing. Right. So, so, see, so yeah, I, I don't think we're that sensitive. Okay, all right, all right. Well, as humans, I was reaching. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. I was fishing for something there. Well, hey, so we're about to go into the jam session here, but Rockstars, I want to remind you that Slough has a fantastic podcast called Sessions with Slough. Some of the episodes may be from previous, but there are great content in there. And so I will include links to Slough and to B Sharp Studio and to Sessions with Slough all in the show notes. And you can find that just at recordingstudiorockstars.com. You can search for Slough, S-L-A-U, and you'll find it. Or you can go right within the podcast app on your iPhone. And if you just press on it, it'll zip up the show notes and it'll have a link straight to the show notes there. So we're gonna go into the jam session now and we'll see you guys in just after this break. Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks 
and you get downloadable multi-tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi-track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com Enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars, it's Lid Shaw with Recording Studio Rockstars, and we're back in now with Slough Halliton for the jam session. Slough, are you ready to jam, my friend? Absolutely. Awesome. Man. Well, so when you were starting out in recording or within your career, what were some things that were holding you back when I was a kid, when I was a wee lad, music, recording just didn't seem like a, a viable employment option. And uh, it, it did take me years to sort of get to that point. So it was nothing in particular. It was almost sort of like self-imposed. I just didn't think that, you know, I could do that for a living. So it's kind of like just a, a little bit of a nothing specific, but kind of just a general feeling that, hey, I don't know if I could do that. Yeah, well, so. remarkably, you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. It just took me longer to get here, but I got here. Okay, so. cool. Uh, what was some of the best advice you received? Two things. One, it relates a little bit more to music. My old piano teacher gave me some advice because, I, you know, at the time when I was in college for music, for audio recording, I was, you know, I was already working. I was essentially working and going to school. So I was recording a lot of fantastic musicians already. And I was just saying to my piano teacher, wow, I was just, I was recording John Stetch, you know, this monster of a pianist. I said, oh God, he's so good. I listened to him and I think, what's the point? What's the point of me playing piano? Really? Because I, I could not, I will never, ever reach his level as a musician. And my teacher said to me, you know what? A musician, no matter how good they are, can only be at one gig at a time. Meaning, hey, there are plenty of gigs out there. There's plenty for the taking. So it doesn't matter if you're the best. There's always going to be something for you. Just go out there and do it. And the other one is just kind of a little bit of advice that uh, I mentioned George Robb. He's said this before, and I think that it's a wise statement, that talent will not get you the gig, but talent will allow you to keep the gigs you get. Because, you know, you could be the greatest, but you need that break. You need those connections. You need to put yourself out there. And you're not going to get a gig because you're so great at, you know, getting a drum sound. You're going to get a gig because somebody you recorded plays the recording for somebody else. And they go, oh, wow, that, that, yeah, that sounds good. I, hey, I'm going to give that person a call. And then it's going to, you know, this is going to lead to the next thing. And that's going to lead to something else. And it's going to be a matter of sort of connections and networking. That's what's going to get you the gig. You know, and a reminder there is that if you are great at getting those drum sounds and you do get them for that first person, you might want to make sure you're getting them for somebody that's going to release the record so that it does get played for their friend. <laughs> well, yeah, one one would hope, yes, one would hope. But speaking of that, though, also, I mean, look, people who are starting out, you know, in recording are probably not going to be working with great musicians. You know, they're going to be working with, you know, amateurs to, you know, hobbyists, enthusiasts, and maybe some decent musicians. That's just the reality, you know. Um there's no real tried and true path to working with great musicians, except just simply being the best, you know, trying to be the best that you can be. Yeah. Well, you got to be near some great you, musicians. That, too, helps, that helps. Yeah. So if you, you, you know, if you're in New York, LA, Nashville, that kind of thing, that goes a long way because you're already in a pond with a lot of fish that 
are really fantastic musicians. I think back to one of the one of the panels at AES, I think it was in San Francisco, and Ed Cherney was saying, you know, about, about his growth as an engineer. You know, he was saying that he was recording drummers, and that was like one of the big sort of badges of honor if you could get a great drum sound, you know, because it's a challenging instrument to, you know, to get to sound right. You know, he was working, you know, recording a lot of drummers, but he was never really satisfied with what he was doing. And at some point, and I won't remember the name, but he mentioned a drummer who obviously was quite an accomplished session drummer, let's say, who came in and Ed put up the mics just as he always did. And he, you know, brings up the faders and it sounds fantastic. And he like, he's stunned and he says, damn, I'm good. And of course, <laughs> as you know, it's not him. It's the drummer, of course. But, you know, when you work with great musicians, they make you sound great. And that's, yeah, it's like that do no harm kind of concept. Just don't yeah. fuck it up, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, it reminds me of a story that I heard. I think it was about Chet Atkins where somebody came up to him and Chet was playing a guitar and he said, he goes, Man, that guitar sounds great, man. And Chet lays it down in the guitar case and he goes, how's it sound now? I know, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, a well-known uh, sort of like story. Whether it's true or not, I'm not sure, but that is... Who cares It doesn't matter, it teaches a lesson. It teaches a lesson, <laughs> yeah. exactly. We're doing music. We live in a land of story. Yes, yes. So um, share with us now a great recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something our rock stars could oh, take away and use today. There is this thing that I've been doing on drum... Not on drum overheads, but sort of like drum room mics that uh, I've asked a lot of engineers and I haven't heard of anybody doing this. I can't imagine that I'm the first person to do this, but I've never heard of anybody doing this. And it is to take a Blumline pair of ribbon mics, and I suppose you could do it with a couple of figure eight condensers as well, obviously. But I, I like to use uh, ribbons on rooms and, and drum overheads. And the Blumline array, of course, records in stereo to the front of the array. And then it records, you know, the rest of the room from behind, you know. So it is practically an omnidirectional kind of a thing, right? But it's uh, mm -hmm. a little bit directional, of course. But rather than, like, if, if you take a pair of, uh, you know, a, Bl a Blumline pair and take them back from the drums, uh, say, about eight or ten feet. Instead of having the, the microphones facing the drum kit, point the nulls, the top of the microphones, where it's rejecting the most, point that at the drums. So then what you're getting from those mics is just room. I mean, yeah, you're getting some direct signal, but just stuff that's bouncing around. And it's a way to, you know, get a room sound that sounds even bigger than if the mics were facing the drum kit. Aim them, like I said, with the nulls pointed at the drums. You can also, even if you have some gobos, you could even put that between the mics and the drums. And then it's really just getting the corners of the room. In other words, the cool. the corner where the ceiling meets the left wall, the corner where the ceiling meets the right floor, the bottom where the floor meets the right side and the left side. Take that and crush the shit out of it. And it is fantastic. <laughs> I mean, it really, if you want to get a, you know, a much bigger room sound, I find that it sounds very natural. And just, you know, of course, dial it in. Yeah, that's a great tip, too, for studio owners, you know, home studios where you don't have a big space and you're really trying to figure out exactly. how to get more of that sound. Exactly. Well, so great tips, Slau. Now, how about a favorite hardware tool for the studio, something that you really like to have around with you when you're on you sessions? You know, I could answer any of these questions in, in a couple of ways. So I'm just going to say that if I had to start over and like, and I had to buy hardware again, microphones are probably one of the first things that I would consider, aside from monitors, of course. I mean, naturally. But to me, like right now, I think I have something like 80 mics in the closet. If I had to start over again, I would just get the Microtech Giffel UM70s. That's all I would use. Oh, yeah. Those are great mics. Uh, they are fantastic. They are my favorite mics, and I could record anything with them. They are just my, my favorite mics these days. Yeah. Nice tip, man. I like that. Um, I actually have a used to use one of those at the studio Alex the Great where I started, and I haven't used it in a while, mm. so... 
I, I just wrote it down. It's going on my, my wish list. I know that mercenary audio at some point, or actually Microtech made like a mercenary audio sort of limited run of those mics, like they reintroduced them because they haven't been made since the 90s or something. And they did have a limited run and they were selling for, I don't know, something like 1900 or something. So they're, they're not cheap, but uh, to me, they're just, they're just worth every penny to me. They're less expensive than 80 microphones. Yes. Well, that, there you go. <laughs> so now, Slough, share with us a favorite software tool for the studio. One tool that I think I know one other person who's using this is uh, WaveBurner from Apple. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with it? Yeah, I used to use it. It's, it came with an earlier version of Logic, and it's what you could use for mastering. And some people used it, some people didn't, of course, whatever. And I still use it to this day, and it runs on the latest OS. I love it. It's fantastic. Just to make very like cool. DDP files or, or anything like that, I use it all the time. I love it. I found it very friendly. Yeah. It was e Once I understood yeah, yeah, yeah. it, it was like easy it. to I like manage. It. And uh, I, you know, I, I don't need to tell people about plugins cool. or anything like that. I mean, come on. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, one tool that you use that many other people use is Pro Tools, but the way that you use it is very unique. Is there any other takeaway for those of us who are who can see that we might want to explore the the voiceover feature for I think reason? it's so specific that I don't know if it would help anybody in any real way, but I would say just because of the fact that uh, as I mentioned, Pro Tools, as we all know, uh, you know, has a real plethora of keyboard shortcuts. I would say learn those keyboard shortcuts, man. People know that it's there. They go, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know, I know. But they, but they sometimes just still will mouse around and you know, and click that way. And that's, I don't know, in a way, it's easier. You don't have to memorize as much. But like the biggest sort of power users that I've ever encountered in Pro Tools, they're all just working on the keyboard, man. Yep, totally. And then Rockstar is a reminder to you that one easy way to get familiar with them is simply to just, you can go on eBay if you need to, and you can buy a dedicated keyboard for your DAW, whether it's Pro Tools or Logic, and they make specific keyboards. Yeah. They might be 80 bucks or something like that, but it's a keyboard that has all the shortcut keys on yes. the keys themselves and yes, they're color coded. Yes. So that's kind of a cool way to do it. All right. So Slough, how about a resource for the business side of running a studio and doing this professionally? One thing, uh, Square. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, for taking square payments. Read, oh my gosh. I mean, I used to, you know, the studio at, at one point used to just be sort of cash or check or whatever. But boy, since I started using Square last year, oh, it's fantastic. I mean, if you're not taking credit cards, if you haven't taken credit cards in the past, there's no excuse. Yes, you're leaving, there's you're no leaving excuse. money on the table. You, you really are. And, and sometimes, like, because I work with some clients that are sort of like really regular basis, kind of like every year we have projects that are ongoing, it gets to the point where, like, you know, at the end of the month, we have done a number of sessions, and I choose not to charge them during those sessions. But at the end of the month, I just send them an invoice and say, hey, you know, I'm going to run the credit card tomorrow. Here's the invoice. Just, you know, make sure everything's okay with that. And, yeah, it's all good. I, I it's fantastic. Nice. I love it. Well, now here's a hypothetical question. This is, imagine yourself starting over in a new city and you need a simple setup to record. You don't know anybody yet. You need to find people to record, make music with, and you need to make ends meet so that you can continue to do this. You've already answered the question as far as the two mics you would choose, but what about the rest of it? What would you use for a simple setup? How would you meet people to record and how would you make ends meet? People generally know that, uh, you know, look, these days a laptop is, is the way to go with some kind of, you know, either Apogee or UA, you know, sort of basic interface, a couple of mics. And, and, and of course, just, you know, get involved in the music scene, you know, just go out there, meet people, hang, you know, there's like no replacement for that. Because you could do all the science experiments you want in your, you know, in your studio. <laughs> and just, if you don't get out there and meet people, it's just not going to lead to anything, you know. You got a network and that's what I would do. I would volunteer sort of to record a few live, you know, events, live bands. But, you know, I might also, you know, undertake a sort of, you know, recording things like, I don't know, panel discussions, conferences, you know, different things. Not not only music venues, but just other things that require audio. You know, audio is required everywhere, everywhere you go. You know, I, I've had some interns here that have gone on to do those gigs and, and I call it putting lavaliers on suits and it's, it can... Be a right. good way to get into the audio and get paid. Yeah. And, you know, hey, it pays bills. So that's a good thing. And then you just have to, um, I think, always 
do a sort of course correction check. You know, if, if you find that you're doing a lot of that stuff and hardly any music, well, okay, well, then you have to make a decision of like whether you want to sort of steer more toward music and it might pay a little bit less. Uh, one of my assistants, you know, she was doing live sound and she enjoyed it a lot, but then she got a gig doing sort of like AV for the New York Historical Society. But it was just like a full, you know, a full-time gig. You know, it was like a five-day-a-week kind of job, at least. And it paid so much more than the live gigs. But, you know, at a certain point, I sort of started wondering, how long is that going to last? Are you really going to do that? And she said, well, you know, for the, for the time being, it's okay. It, you know, it's better money for now, and then we'll see. You know, and I think that's that's what you have to sort of reassess at a certain point. Yeah. Okay, so quick question before we move to the last one about um, choosing a DAW. I know that some people, sometimes when you're starting out, you're thinking, ah, geez, should I learn how to use Pro Tools? But what about Logic? W what about this other one, Studio One? And, you know, the, the list goes on. Have you found in your experience that you can really make a wrong choice when you're starting out about choosing a DAW? Or have you found that they are all capable? What advice do you have? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think that pretty much anything you choose, you know, they, they all do pretty much the same thing, you know, to within 90%, right? I, you know, I think Pro Tools certainly is ubiquitous, and I think that it's wise to know it. It almost becomes a religious debate or like a Mac versus PC kind of debate, Pro Tools versus whatever Logic or Reaper or whatever. You know, that to me is, it's it's kind of nonsense. I never partake in sort of like debates about that stuff. It's really just music you know, versus not music. That That's all. I mean, it's like, who cares what tool you're using? What are you doing? with it. Yeah. You know, like, are you doing something? I, it doesn't matter if you're using Amadeus or something, you know? GarageBand. People are recording albums on GarageBand. Yeah, cool. You know, I mean, just just use it. Just use whatever you have. All right, so here's the last one. This is the whopper of a question, and it wasn't on your list. You Ooh. didn't see it coming. Okay. What, oh, boy. What's, <laughs> what's the single most important thing, Slough, that our listeners can do to become a rock star of the recording studio themselves? Well, I will answer this this way. I don't think there is a single most important. That's how I will answer okay. that. Because you as a human being are a whole person. You are not a Pro Tools operator. You are not a person who knows what the business end of a 57 is. You are a person with a personality. You are a person with opinions. You are a person, you know, with interesting things to say or not, whatever. But I think you as a person have to try to become the most knowledgeable, the most fun person to be with. Because people are going to come to you because they trust you, that they feel feel good about being around you, especially if you have an eight or 10 hour session in a day. So I don't think it's a single thing. I think you have to become the best person, the best all around fun person that you can be in order to be a rock star. Because uh, it doesn't matter how much you know, if you're an asshole, nobody's going to want to be with you. <laughs> That's true. Well, you, maybe you'll only work with assholes. I don't know. You can be a nice guy and still work with assholes too. I don't think it's it's really ever one thing. That's that's the thing. It's like to say a lot of people like to say that the integrity is only as good as the weakest link in the chain. Mm. You know. Mm. So make sure you got uh, good coffee. Yeah, make sure you have good coffee. But I mean, while that may be true, it's not just that weakest link. It's it's everything. It's you know, is is the bathroom clean? Is you know, is the coffee good? Yeah, exactly. It's, I mean, it's funny you bring that up. I try to have a policy here that there's always three extra rolls of toilet paper sitting on top of the toilet. <laughs> I just because I, you know, I tell everybody, I'm like, look, the last thing you want somebody to go through is running out of toilet paper in a studio. Hey, talk about you know really kind of spoiling the moment for somebody. Totally. There are two other things that came to mind that I would like to mention. He mentioned Mixer Man before, and I certainly did an interview with him on the podcast. I think we even did two actually. His Zen and the art of, uh, you know, mixing, recording, producing are fantastic resources that you can read as a beginner or a total seasoned pro and still get stuff out of mm -hmm. it. I would so highly recommend that series of books. Maybe they should be read in the order they were written, which would have been mixing, producing, and recording. But I suppose it doesn't really matter. I would so highly recommend those things because those books are books that you can read now and you could read a year from now and you could read four years from now 
and you will still get stuff out of them. And the other thing, just to sort of get back to or continue this idea of like be the you know, best person you want to be, I've had the opportunity to hang out with some, you know, huge names, engineers that are, you know, just giants in the industry. And I'll tell you that there's one thing that they all have in common is that they are just fun to hang out with and they're really good people. You know, they're never know-it-alls. They never, like, blow off an idea. They never say, but that's stupid or something. That would never. Um, yeah. They are all supremely confident. You have to be confident. And I think I'm confident to a fault. I think before I met my wife, I thought, you know, well, you know, I know this, I know the answer is this, et cetera, et cetera. And if there's anything I learned from my wife over the years is that I could be wrong. And that's a really important lesson to learn. Yeah, I, I've learned but, that I'm wrong all the time. Yeah, well, now that people have iPhones and Google, you know, I if I mention something, my wife says, is that really true? And then, of course, she's click, 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 click. You know, she's, no, 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 that's not actually the case. But it's important to be confident be open to the possibility that you could be wrong, but no matter what, just be the kind of person that people want to sort of gravitate toward. That is going to be worth so much as as a person who owns a business mm -hmm. because that's really what, you know, if you're in the recording business, the recording industry, it's a business. You're providing a service. Yeah. And, you know, there's definitely more than one engineer people can go to. Yeah. There's all kinds of people it can go to. And you want to make that path of resistance the least that it can be. Well, I think that's great advice to go out on, Slough. Um, Ted, before we sign off, though, I want to thank you again. But tell our listeners how they can find you and learn more about you and, and follow you. Oh, yeah. People, they, they really shouldn't find me. I, I don't think that's a good idea. Okay. Right. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, you know what the thing is? You know, I did run the podcast for a while, which of course has been defunct for a while, but I am in the process of sort of rebooting that. But all, all those interviews are still there though. So I mean, it's tons of great content. I think content. they still are. Yeah, I, I still, I, I think the files and everything are still up in iTunes, but like the feed doesn't work right now because it's being moved and et cetera, et cetera. But look, if people want to contact me directly, they can do so at slough at bsharpstudios.com. So it's S-L-A-U at B-E-S-H-A-R-P-S-T-U-D-I-O-S.com. I am on the social media there on Twitter. I think it's Slough B Sharp, if I recall. So S L A U B E S H A R P. I think that's about awesome. It. Well, Slough, thank you so much for being here on Recording Studio Rockstars, and uh, again, a thank you to Jose Neto who connected the two of us and, and suggested that I reach out to you. It was a great interview, and it's just been a pleasure hanging out with you. Oh, it's a pleasure to be asked, and and I appreciate it so much. Yeah, Thanks. groovy. Well, we'll see you around the studio, and uh, uh, I look forward to meeting you in person at some point. Sounds good. Man. All right, dude. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.